right. So hi, everybody. I'm David Perel. I run an online course called Rite of Passage, which starts the next cohort starts on Wednesday. Uh, in that, I have taught more than 400 people to write from more than 40 countries. There's some alums on the call right now. Great to see all of you and some other people who are going to be joining in the new cohort. So thank you all for the people who are here. So basically, this is part of what I'm calling Writing Week. And so it's a series of different writing workshops, just like this one. And there's two live interviews. So with Alex today, with Nathan Berry, the CEO of ConvertKit on Thursday, I'm doing a live writing workshop. Uh, tomorrow, I'm doing another one Saturday, a live Q&A on Sunday. I also just launched a Rite of Passage podcast of, with 20 episodes that are all two to six minutes long. So this is the week of writing all to celebrate that Rite of Passage course, which begins on Wednesday. And basically, the backstory here with Alex is before I ever started writing, I remember sitting on a beanbag chair on a Friday afternoon in college. This is my senior year when I was just trying to get my shit together. And I remember reading Alex's writing and say, oh, saying, oh my goodness, this guy has a perspective and a rigor and an energy that I wanted to emulate in my own writing. And so Alex has been a huge inspiration for me, has become a friend. He's writing a book on on sort of the interplay of scarcity and abundance and how technology sort of plays with that. And he just wrote a book or an article called Debt is Coming, which has gone absolutely viral. And he is going to talk about that with us today. So I'm going to introduce Alex. Alex, give a quick background of yourself, quick background of the article, and then we'll roll and get into it. Sure, this sounds great. Um, hey, everybody, and thank you so much to David for the introduction. Um, it was funny. I was thinking back when we the when we first met in person, which is when I went on David's podcast. Uh, I had gotten an email sort of a long time ago from David. You had found my personal email and sent me a thing like, "Hey, would you like to come on my podcast?" And I remember at the time thinking like, "Oh, like I should get around to doing that," but it sort of got lost amidst all of the stuff that I was currently working on. And then it finally came together, and it was just one of the most engaging and fun and interesting times that I've ever had speaking to somebody in an interview format before. I thought, okay, this is definitely going somewhere. Uh, I would love to do more stuff with David, however, uh, is possible. And so seeing Rite of Passage come together uh, and seeing all you guys here listening uh, to, you know, all of the really just first class insights and advice that David has for all of you, I'm just really overjoyed to be a part of it. So this is just such a pleasure to be here. Uh, to give you a little bit of background on myself, I have had this very unusual career arc that doesn't really make sense to anybody, except for there's been one, this one common thread that's tied it all together, which is writing. Um, basically, everything good that has ever happened to me in my career has come because of writing online and mouthing off on the internet and uh, just writing things down and provoking <laughs> people to pay attention to it. Um, my background is in life sciences originally. Um, I was in grad school doing uh, neuroscience research and then I fairly, like uh, several years ago, and then I fairly quickly realized that I didn't want to be doing that. Uh, I wanted to go do something on my own. And so I ended up starting a startup and that's how I got into the startup world. Um, and my the I had started writing online. My blog was how I found my co-founder for my first startup. Uh, my blog was how I ended up writing something that got me noticed and ultimately brought into the uh, venture capital world. Uh, I worked at a venture capital firm called Social Capital for four years, uh, and they had found me through my online writing. Uh, while I was there, one of the things that I did there, in addition to doing some early stage investing on a team called the Discover Team, was I also wrote the Social Capital newsletter, which was a lot of fun. And since then, over the past year, I've been going out on my own and really, really like going hard on my own newsletter and my own writing and a bunch of stuff. I, I'm still doing some venture things uh, on the side, but mostly like the main thing that I'm doing now is writing. So I am I have a weekly newsletter that comes out on Sundays. Uh, it's just called Alex Danko's newsletter. You can find it at danko.substack.com. Um, I'm going to plug Substack, by the way, that is what you should all be using for your online newsletters. Uh, it's really good. It's free. It works. It's the best. Uh, and I'm also, as David mentioned, I'm doing an interesting experimental project. I'm writing a book. 
uh, in a quasi public format. Uh, I'm writing a book sort of like chapter by chapter and I'm putting together this first draft uh, in half public. Um, I have it, I have a group of people who pay $10 a month to subscribe to this little project and they get basically a first look at all of these drafts that I'm writing and these ideas that I'm putting together on an approximately weekly basis. Uh, if any of you would like to join that, I would love to have you. Um, unfortunately, I can't make it free because I don't want there to be too, too many people in here. Uh, but if you'd like to join, you can join at scarcity.substack.com. So that's my one and only plug for the book project. I'd love to see some of you in there if you'd like to participate. Uh, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, and I'm here to uh, share for the next 55 minutes or so, hopefully some, some big perspectives and then some on the ground tactics for how to write better, how to write faster, how to write well. Uh, so I'm all yours. Awesome. Well, Alex, would you rather talk about, you wrote the five things. Let's just start off with one thing sort of, and then we'll work down into the article that you just wrote. Can you yeah, talk yeah. about the importance of taking notes? Like one of the things that both of us wholeheartedly agree upon is not to write with an empty page, actually write from abundance instead of scarcity. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I can, I can, if I can pull up on the screen, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Dave is absolutely right in that one of the biggest challenges that people have with writing, if they're especially um, starting out at the beginning of their writing careers or they don't write professionally or on a very regular basis, is how to start. Uh, writing is, is a little writing is a little bit like working out. Like when you're in the middle of a workout, it's a lot easier to keep going than it is to start from cold. Uh, and with writing is no exception. Uh, I think people have the hardest time and they're like, okay, I have something I want to talk about, but I have a, having a really hard time engaging, like writing the first paragraph, writing the first sentence, writing the first um, articulation of what's important. And so there are a lot of ways that you can get around this uh, in terms of like, how do, you, how do you sort of break the friction of starting with a blank page? And the answer is never start with a blank page, like David said. It's like, I don't care what you do, right? Find some quotes that are related to what you're writing and paste them in. One thing that I often do a lot with my newsletter is I will start with some tweets that people have made that are related to the topic. And I will literally just take screenshots of them and drop them in my Evernote. Uh, I will do that. I'll show you some examples of this in a second. Uh, I will write some scribbled outlines often on paper. I will, I'm a very visual thinker, so I will make a lot of drawings, right, of the point that I'm trying to make or of, of any, anything, anything at all that is related to the logic of what I'm trying to communicate. Just draw it, take a picture of it, and then drag the picture into your Evernote doc or whatever you use to take notes, right? It's like, just start with something. It doesn't matter what it is, and it doesn't matter if it never makes it into the final version, right? Like, this is for you, it's not for the final piece, right? It's just to help you get started. Uh, why don't I actually share this screen? Hmm, David, can you, I, so David, I sent you a link to this Evernote doc, can you share it and bring it up? Yeah, of course. Do you email it to me? Yeah. Cool. Sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. <laughs> um, while we're dealing with it, uh, yeah. Alex, I, just while I get it up, why don't you sort of unshare your screen now um, and, I just dropped a quote in the chat that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. One of the things that you said like a year and a half ago that I just sort of pulled up in my notes was that people overestimate how much return they'll get from writing in the short term, but they underestimate what they'll get in the long term. And so a blog is sort of your brain evolving over time and the value is actually in the body of work that you've accumulated. And what you say, the maturity of thought that comes with it is has more value than any one single piece of writing. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think that's totally correct. And I think it's correct at two levels. Um, the first level is uh, external, right? Like when people, people always, so the, the, a lot of time when people write something and there's like, they have some agenda with writing it. Like a lot of it is like, hey, I want to get noticed by somebody in this field. Or like, I want to uh, get people to agree with me on something. They write it and they release it out into the world. And then what happens is, some people read it, but not as many as you'd hoped. And then three or four days later, everybody has forgotten about it and you're bummed out, right? You're like, man, nobody read my piece, right? That's a shame. Like, well, keep doing that, right? Because at some point what's gonna happen is as you write more and as people start to read your stuff a little bit more, what's gonna happen is all of the body of work that you've already produced is going to be there for your readers to find and then for them to like browse around things you've written. So it creates a depth to what you've produced and it creates a body of work that you've produced that is way, way more valuable than any one piece alone, right? The compounded value of your writing is huge and you shouldn't underestimate it. 
The second reason why it's important to have this big body of work is actually internal. It's because the more you write, the better your writing is going to get, right? This is just a fundamental fact of writing is the more, the more you write the, and the, the faster you write and the more fluently you write and the more just of a second nature it becomes, the naturally better it's going to be right as you uh, come up with it, right? It's, there's a sort of a, David, I think you've heard me say this before. My favorite little parable about this is the um, pottery teacher story. Um, so you have a pottery teacher who has two students, right? And they both want to learn how to make clay pots. So he goes to student one. He says, okay, student one, it's Monday. Your job by Friday is to try to create one perfect pot. That's your job. Make one perfect pot. Then he goes to student two and he says, okay, by Friday, I want you to make as many pots as possible. I don't care if they're any good. You want to make, you want to just mass produce a bunch of pots. So then the teacher leaves. He comes back on Friday. And what does he find? It's like, well, not only has student two made a huge number of pots to the other students only one, but every single pot is better than the first student's attempt at a perfect pot, right? Because the way that you learn how to make really good pots is just by making them, right? It's not to try to study and agonize over how to make the one perfect thing. It's just to mass produce them, right? It's very, very procedural stuff. So the reason why having this big body of work is valuable internally to you is because the more that you, the more pots you've made, the better any given one will be, and the more you can sort of see the depth of what you've produced that contributes to your own thinking. So that's why I highly recommend to people write a lot and keep all of it. Ideally, if you can, keep it all publicly so that other people can find it, because you never know, right? What that you've written a long time ago is going to really be the thing that somebody was looking for, right? You never, you absolutely never know. You have no idea. Absolutely. I love that parable. I just dropped the, uh, I just dropped sort of a screenshot of the text from that. If you want to just save it and, and, and save it your own note taking file, Alex, I'm trying to find the thing that you sent me. Do you have a link that you can just drop in the chat that I can share my screen with? Yeah, sure. I can do that. Okay. One sec. That work right to you? Yeah, this is right. This is perfect. Okay. So perfect. we ran this topic of, um, what are you know what are what are some tips and tactical things that I took notes for as I was writing uh, this post last week, thinking ahead and saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to be talking with David and a bunch of people for write a passage. So one of the things that I wanted to I took uh, care to write down was at the very beginning of this process, what did it look like? Um, so here I can sort of show you this sort of like what does it look like at the very beginning? So here are some of the notes that I took uh, just right at the start. You can see here this is a um, this is a picture that I took of a notebook where I'm sort of scrolling down like, okay, here are a couple of basic ideas here. You know, here are a couple of graphs. If you can scroll down a little bit, David. Um, you know, here are some examples of like, I'm trying to sketch out the main points that I'm trying to make. This second page is something, none of this ended up in the original, in the final post. Like absolutely none of that ended up uh, showing up. But it doesn't matter, right? This is just for you to start getting going. Uh, if you can scroll down a little bit more, um, to this next one, you'll notice that this looks like something that you may notice if you read the post as one of the sort of diagrams in there. This became my first anchor point that I tangibly started writing around, right? So this is what it originally looks like scrawled in some notebook. Just to give you a sense of like, give yourself any kind of anchor um, to start writing from. Uh, here, David, let me send you another... Um, let me send you another link to something. Great. Okay. So why don't I walk you through what this looks like? Um, so here you can see, so like at the very beginning is this screenshot of somebody who tweeted at me something in their inbox, right? Which was related to something that I had tweeted out a week before, right? This is really just like a little note for me to be like, hey, what is it that we're talking about? What gave me the original idea to write this piece? And that was that somebody had tweeted this thing at me, right, about something called production capital, which is one of the themes I talk about in this essay. So one of the first things that I do is I'll just slap this at the top of the Evernote document. And sometimes it'll keep its way in there. Like very often I will publish things that like have these prompts in there at the very beginning. Like I, I'm a very fond of writing like, here's a tweet that I noticed that made me think about something and then I'll just show it. In this case, it didn't stick, make it into the final round. I ended up deleting it because it wasn't necessary, so it doesn't matter, but it helped me get started, right? So that's what kind of counts here. Uh, if you want to keep scrolling down here. So this is a dead is coming. So this is February 5th noon draft. So 
if you look here at, um, this says the deployment period. Let me give you my next sort of hint for like how to get started, which is one of the big blocks that people have when they're sitting in front of a blank page or sitting in front of a page with a little bit of notes. They're like, okay, what should I start writing? Don't write the introduction to your essay first, right? You should leave that until last. The first thing that you should start writing, in my opinion, in my experience, is what feels like the most procedural and the most boring of the writing you're going to have to do, mm -hmm. right? It's like, think about what approximately you're going to have to say and be like, okay, is there any writing that I know and I could explain in my sleep and is like necessary background information for the reader that I want to communicate? Odds are there'll be something like this, right? Write this first, right? There are two reasons to write it first. The first reason to write it first is because it'll be the easiest thing for you to write, right? You should, there should be something in this essay that you know pretty cold, right? That you can just be like, okay, I have to write, I have to write this down, I have to spend this, I can write this fairly quickly. And you just write it as if I'm talking to somebody about it. The second reason why you should start with what is just like really, really familiar to you is because you may not realize it, but this is probably gonna be the most important stuff in the entire essay. Mm. Um, there's a, a line that um, I've heard from David and somebody else, I think, which is the like, look at your fish line. Do you, David, can you actually say what that line is in full? I can't remember it exactly. I don't want to butcher it. Yeah, I, I was worried I was on mute. It's so funny that you said that. I actually recorded a three minute po podcast about, about this this morning, about an hour ago. So like, it is so top of mind. I love this concept. So basically there was a Harvard teacher and he was a writing teacher back in like the 19th century, okay? And on the very first day of class, what he does is he takes a fish, right? So let's pretend it's like one of those Nemo fishes, right? It's like the size of your hand and it's orange and white. And he leaves the class and he tells all the students, write about what you see. And he takes the fish out of a jar and puts it on the table. He goes out and he comes back and he goes, students, what did you see? And all the students are like, what are you talking about? You just put a fish on the table, then you left, nothing happened. There's nothing to write about. And he goes, ah, that's actually not true. Actually, look at the fish. So it does this day after day after day. And on the last day of the semester, they have to like write an essay about what is on the table. And so, once again, the teacher takes a fish out of the jar, puts it on the table, and says, write about what you see. And all the students just produce essays. They start talking about the way that the fins are resting on the table, the way that the eyes pop out of the socket in the front of their head, the way that the orange light actually reflects with the fluorescent lighting of the room. And all of a sudden, you have the exact same experience. And in the course of a semester, you go from, well, there's nothing to write about of oh my goodness, there is so much to say. And so David McCullough, who's one of the top biographers for American history, right above his desk, he has a note to himself, which says, look at your fish. The point being, there is so much more information in the world than you're processing, and you have to double look, triple look, quadruple look, and look at your fish. Okay. Um, yeah, th thanks for that story. I think where... Where I think about the fish story, especially in relation to start with what seems obvious to you is, and start with what is right in front of you, is the best essays that you guys are going to produce are going to be about topics that seem really obvious to you, right? But that may not be obvious to somebody else, right? It's like the most useful part of anything that you're writing and what ultimately become sort of the, the most interesting essays and the most interesting posts are not ones where you're going to sit down and be like, this is a big mystery and I have to logically think out what the answer is and be creative. No, 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 no. It's just like, talk about something that is super clear to you, but that might not be necessarily clear to somebody else. And you're going to have to explain it just to get them onto the same page. A lot of time, just the act of doing that is going to turn out to be this very, very interesting uh, set of information, right? That should honestly become the basis for your entire essay. So this is why I recommend that people start with the portion of the essay that to you is going to feel the most procedural and the most rote, because it's probably going to be the most important part, but it will also be the easiest for you to write. So that's where you should start from. And as you are writing it, what often happens to me and may hopefully happen to you is you realize that this is something that you're good at writing about and you'll enjoy the process more, right? No one likes writing something that feels excruciating them to write. 
but people like writing something where you feel like an expert at it and you feel good at it because it, you know you feel you feel confident you feel familiar you feel that as if you're helping somebody just get on your level about something those tend to be the best posts so if you take something out of this like i really hope that that's it right is um not like the entire essay doesn't have to be something that you know cold in fact writing about something is a great way to learn about new topics um, but make sure that you at least have a foothold into some aspect of the world that you know very well, right? In fact, you can sort of think of this as saying like every essay should have two components, right? There's your foothold that you know super well, and there's where you're going to reach from that foothold, which is an aspect of the world that you would like to learn a little bit about and want to use this writing as an excuse and an opportunity to go learn, right? That's one way you can think about this, but you have to have a foothold. If you don't have a foothold, then nothing's going to work, right? You're going to produce something that is going to be either wrong or trivial most of the time. But if you do have a foothold, you can produce something that's correct, right? And that seems obvious to you, but is going to be important. It's going to be helpful for people, right? That's stuff that readers actually want to read. Where do you want me to go? Um, how about this? Uh, why don't we, if, if you want to go through um, that, in this, that initial rough draft, I can either walk through it and show you like, examples of like how I was putting this together, what I was thinking, maybe we can do that, but that might be too hard to do online. One thing that I sort of prepare, one like very tactical thing that I put together that's a real example from writing this was how to edit a sentence. Uh, this is one of the most useful yeah. things anybody ever yeah, taught me writing ever. Why don't we go to that? Okay, so can you go back to the initial thing that I sent you? Uh, the one that has the pictures? Mm. Yep. Uh, and then scroll down. Mm. Are you seeing? Okay, how here we go. Sentences? How to write strong sentences. Cool. This is sort of, hopefully this will be a really tangible and tactical ways that you can improve some of your writing. So some of the highest yield things that you can do is um, when you're in the middle of your writing is to just tackle sentences one by one and turn weak sentences into strong ones. So this is a real example from the post that I just uh, wrote is I'll show you a sentence that starts out quite large and quite flabby and that through progressive editing, I got down to something very tight and pretty strong. So the original sentence, so the context here is I'm talking about this other book, which is a book called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital by Carlotta Perez, which is a really good book. I'm talking about this book in the introductory paragraphs of the essay. And one point that I wanna make is like, oh, this is really good book to read along with this companion book, which is a book called Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy by Bill Janeway. Um, so I'll show you the original sentence here was, it's a good book to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, which is probably the number one book that has most influenced my own thinking. Right, so, you know, there you go. That's a sentence. That's the kind of sentence that I could imagine myself speaking out loud. Uh, it's a fine sentence to speak out loud, but as a written sentence, uh, it's a bit large. It's a bit verbose. Um, it could be tighter. You know, you look at this and you're like, okay, let's see if we can tune this up a little bit. So let's look at edit number one, right? So edit number one is, let's go look if there are any words that are actually just totally unnecessary because they clarify something that doesn't actually need any clarification, right? So how about the word book, right? I say, it's a good book to read alongside this other book. Everybody knows it's a book. You don't need to specify that it's a book, right? So let's, let's try taking that out. So let's take out the word book. It's good to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, which is probably the number one book that has most influenced my own thinking. Okay, good. We took out a couple of words. That's a little tighter. What's the next thing? So let's say edit number two, which is say, if you mean it, you know, say it. So try to eliminate qualifiers and hesitations and hedges. So this is something that people naturally do a lot in their writing too, is, you know, you, you say something and then you're like, oh, I, I want to create a comfortable amount of padding around that sentence just to make sure that, you know, nobody takes this out of context or gets mad at me for saying that. So, no, if you mean something, actually say it, right? If something is the most this, say so. If something absolutely is this, then say so, right? So here, you know, I had said like, it's good to read alongside Bill Janeway's book, Doing Capitalism, which is probably the number one book that's most influenced my own thinking. No, let's get rid of the, which is probably. Right? Why do I need to say that it's probably the number one book that's influenced my thinking? No, if you mean it, say it. Let's get rid of it. The nice thing about this, by the way, as a happy anecdote, is that 
Bill personally emailed me afterwards to say thank you, and I've never actually spoken with him before. So that was really delightful, right? The essay found its way to him, and he reached out and said, hey, thanks for citing my stuff. This is really great. You know, I'd love to get connected. So, hey, you wow. never know, right? That's so cool. It's very cool, right? It's really exciting. So, like, if you mean it, say it, because you never know what kind of good thing may happen from you actually being direct about what you mean. So that's cool. So let's take out this probably stuff. So now let's see. It's good to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, the number one book that has most influenced my own thinking. Okay, we're, we're getting somewhere. Let's see if we can take out some more words. So here we can say this like, the number one book that has most influenced my own thinking. That still seems like it is too many words, right? Let's try taking out number one, right? You're already saying it's most influenced your own thinking. You don't need to say it's the number one thing that's most influenced my thinking, that's redundant. So let's take that out. Now we have, it's good to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, the book that has most influenced my own thinking. Better, right? There's still one major thing that we can do. And this is a hard one, but it's, a real, it's one that'll really, really pay dividends, which is whenever possible, get rid of any verb construction that uses the verb to be in hmm. any form. This is something, this was something, right? It is good to do something and replace it with an active verb that's gonna be much stronger. So when I was in 11th grade English, I had a writing teacher named Miss Page who made us do this writing exercise, which was in any given paper, we were not allowed to use the verb to be at all ever. We, maybe we could use it like five times or something. Like we had to pick them wisely. And then every time we used it over our limit, we got docked a point, right, for every single time. So it forces you to really think, do I absolutely have to use a weaker verb construction where I could use an active verb directly? Right? It's a fantastic writing exercise. It's hard. It really uses your brain, but it makes your writing so much better. So let's look at this example. It's good to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism. Well, what am I trying to say? It sounds like if I'm saying it's good for you to read this book, it sounds like I want for you to read the book. Is there a more direct way I can say that? Yeah, I can just say, read the book, right? Read it alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, the book that has most influenced my own thinking. There we go, like that's a better sentence, right? Like you could probably even keep going more, right? Like the end of the sentence still may have an extra word or something, but like, I don't know, I'm pretty happy with this sentence. I think we can leave it here. So let's compare, right? The beginning and the end, we can scroll back up, right? So the initially, like the sentence we had, it's a good book to read alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, which is probably the number one book that has most influenced my own thinking. Uh, now let's go to the bottom, we have, Read it alongside Bill Janeway's Doing Capitalism, the book that has most influenced my own thinking. What a better sentence, right? What a much yeah. better sentence, right? So you don't have to go through your essays and systematically like pare down all of the fat off of every sentence. Uh, that's a little bit aggressive. Like it's good to have some sentences that are a little bit unnecessarily verbose or have a little bit of sentences that are padding. That's fine. It's like a steak. You know, you want there to be a little bit of marbling. It doesn't need to be completely like lean meat, but you don't want too much, right? Like it's a good exercise to go through and fi you know, find the sentences in your writing that are unnecessarily flabby and just try to go through the exercise of tightening them up. Uh, it's a very good editing exercise. It'll force you to confront what you're actually trying to say especially the exercise of forcing yourself to use active verbs, uh, I find is a really good way of forcing people to get to the point of what they're saying. Um, it also sort of echoes back to a, a point that David has said a bunch of times that I really like, which is vary the lengths of your sentences. Um, it's really nice. Writing reads much better when sentences are of different lengths. And you can use this as a method to really try to pare down some of them and then leave others be a little bit lighter and longer, right? Let there be some variety. But in order, in order to have variety, you have to have the ability to pare them down when necessary, right? You have to have mastered your own writing enough to be able to shorten it if you want to, right? That is really an essential exercise to go through. I have a couple of questions. Do you think that, I guess my big one here is there are always exceptions to things. So you mentioned, say what you mean, but then mm -hmm. you get those people who respond and they say, well, have you thought about this one exception? And so as a result, there's always a temptation to use words like probably or mostly, but they dilute the quality of your writing. So when you say, say what you mean, and you say debt is coming, other people might say, well, it 
it's already here or it's actually not fully coming. And they'll sort of try to pick out nuance, which yes, they might be technically right, but it actually is really bad writing. How would you think about that trade-off? Uh, well, the first thing about the trade-off is don't worry about like, if you're trying to write an essay and the point of the essay is to create a stake in the ground around some point that you want to establish, if you want people to read your writing, you know, create sides and then force people to take one, hmm. right? Force people to take a side and understand what the other side of the point you're saying is, right? If you are writing something and you cannot think of any possible reason that you are wrong, or you cannot think of any way that somebody might disagree with you, then either you don't understand what you're talking about well enough, or you're talking about something that's not that interesting, maybe, right? This may not necessarily be the case for a lot of writing. Like there may, if, you're, if you are just purely writing for description, or if you are purely telling a story of what happened, if what you're doing is strictly observational writing, then this may not always be true. But if what you're trying to do is establish a stake in the ground around a point and get a discussion start of, starting, then honestly, the best advice you can follow is create sides and force people to take one. You can take your side or you can take the other side. Either is fine, right? Once you are in this mindset, of course, you're going to eliminate every kind of word like maybe or probably or perhaps or whatever. No, there's no, there's no room for that, right? Create some controversy, right? It'll do you some good. How are you, I remember when we spoke a couple months ago, you said that your limit is like 5,000 words per week, which is really impressive. How is it that you're able to cultivate those ideas and begin to stir on them week after week? What are you doing? Like for me, one thing that is absolutely irreplaceable is just having conversations with really smart people. If I'm just thinking to myself, I can't actually get the ideas out of my brain and make them concrete. For you, I know that you like to run. What are the other things that are really helpful for you? Because your cadence and pace of output is about as high as anyone I know. Um, that's a good question. Well, I was thinking about this, like how long did it take me to write the debt piece? Um, so it's, it's about 3000 words. And I, it, I would say like, it took me four years to think about it and then two days to write. Um, which is going to be the case for a lot of this stuff, right? It's like you accumulate a lot of this um, knowledge in your point of view over a very long time. But then once you have that, you should hopefully be able to write this stuff fairly quickly if you are in practice of this stuff. I don't know. I think I wrote the first... In a, in a, in a, if, I'm, if I'm actually writing for a good chunk of the day, I can put out 2,000 words in a day. Um, and this is not actually writing fast. Like this is a lot of people are like, 2,000 words in a day, like that's so fast. It's actually not like if you're actually just writing like directly straight through a train of thought, you can write 500 words in a matter of minutes if you're just writing your stream of consciousness, right? The key to writing fast is to having your stream of consciousness be good writing, which is something that only comes true the more you write, right? The more you write, the just like the less you are going to have to work to make what just sort of automatically comes out of your writing be a plausible first draft of stuff. Um, That's really interesting. I remember. I remember there was a post that wrote one time where he said that the best way to become a better speaker is to write about the thing that you're speaking about. And so then once you actually speak, you are actually just saying, going from the structure of what you've already written, but you're going a step farther. You're basically saying there, when you write, you learn to think logically and structure your ideas in a way that then you can speak about it better, but not just that, your actual state of conscious processing is already being dictated by the logic that writing demands. I've never thought of that before. That's really interesting. That's right. And I would, I would even think of that in a level that is dumber than the like organizational logic of the point you're trying to make. I just mean like, can you speak in complete sentences that are like yeah. good English, right? It's not even like, oh, can you put advanced thoughts together in like logically arranged paragraphs? No, it's just literally like, can you like output something just like without even thinking about it, like writing on your keyboard and then look at it and have this be like, okay, that's like, not the greatest writing, but like it's a plausible first draft, right? So one suggestion that I have for people is read your own writing and read it a lot, 
Um, I probably spend at least an hour a week reading my own writing. Uh, and it's not just vanity, like there's actually a point to this, which is um, the way that you become a better writer is by reading lots of writing, right? It's like, this is why you should read books, right? This is why you should read anything, right? Is you sort of absorb the sentence construction and the themes and the idioms and just the, 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 the writing voice and cadence of what you're reading, right? So it's like, naturally, this makes sense that you should read people who are good writers. But why read your own writing? It's like, well, the style that's most important for you to master is your own, right? If you can master your own style and work on that, right, and spend 80% of your time at least working on your strengths, then writing and sounding like you will be easier and easier for you to do, right? There's not much point for like, I don't know, like reading a bunch of Hemingway and then being like, I'm going to write like Hemingway. It's like, that's fine if what you're trying to do is like imitate him for the purpose of some essay. But what you actually want to do is write like yourself, right? So the way that you learn how to more frictionlessly write like yourself is to read yourself, right? Just read yourself a lot, right? You don't have to read it critically. Like you don't have to go in and like edit or whatever. Just even read it passively. It can be something that you do when you're like on the subway or like you have your phone or you're waiting in line at the grocery stores. Like go read through a little bit of your old writing. It may not seem like it's doing anything, but I promise you it's one of the best ways to compound your own writing proficiency, right? Every time you do it, it makes your writing like 1% less hard and that pays you enormous benefits over time. Interesting. Can you walk me through the process of like, so you're scrolling Twitter, you're having a conversation and what does it look like pre charts that you showed us before once you have the epiphany do you go you write about it right away do you try to think of it over time how does that actually look and when do you know I, you have to have one of these every single week when do you know ha i caught my fish i now know to reel it in rather than you know what this is just a six inch fish and i'm looking for a 16 inch fish this week so that's okay i'm glad you brought that up because i would say only 50% of the time at most do I have one of those clued in moments at the beginning where like, okay, I know the point that I'm trying to make. Half of the time at most, right? I would say 50% of the time, it's actually like, oh crap, I got to write a newsletter this week and I have no idea what I'm going to say. What is something that I can plausibly start with? And then as I write, figure out something that's interesting to say. Right. Some of my favorite essays have been points that are completely not something that I set out trying to write about. Right. But it's the process of writing that gets you thinking like, oh, maybe my original point actually wasn't that interesting or, oh, maybe this original thesis that I had is in fact totally wrong. And I just didn't really understand the issue. But as you write and as you learn about what you're writing about, you realize, oh, but there's this other point that I could make. So I'd say only 50 percent of the time or so do I like know ahead of time what I'm going to write about. But I'm glad you mentioned Twitter because Twitter is just an evergreen source of ideas for things to write about. Because, you know, when you used it, I don't know how many of you, what percentage of you use Twitter, but when you're on Twitter, you can get a sense for what people are talking about and what the shape of the arguments are around that thing. Mm -hmm. And especially like if you, if you, if you're clued into this and you pay attention, you can get a sense for what is the white space that, re that is remaining for people to say something interesting. So if you notice that everybody seems to be dancing around some issue, but nobody has ever like come out and said it, like, hey, maybe that's a really good opening for you to go out and say it, right? Go do your reading, like do your homework and make sure you're not totally talking out of your ass, right? But then go say it, right? Go decide like, okay, in one week, I'm going to write an essay about this, right? I have to go figure it out <laughs> and I have to go write it, right? Like having a deadline and basically saying like, okay, well, I need to produce something by this certain date. I better go learn about this, right? I better go browse around and see what people are talking about or maybe go back and read some source material or whatever. I don't care how you do it, but the minute that you realize here is something that I'm going to need to learn about by this certain deadline is a great way to force yourself to get into the mode of shipping something all the time, right? Because you have to ship something on a regular basis. That's the most important habit that you can develop. Exactly. I want to just reiterate that. Ship something on a regular basis. That is the most important habit you can develop. I couldn't agree more. That is... Like in Rite of Passage, we say you have to publish something every single week because it's just like working out where once you actually get that habit and you are shipping over and over and over, you begin to see these positive benefits and the scale sort of tips where it becomes a habit 
and the gravity kind of flows with you actually being able to produce consistently. And I couldn't agree more. The, the most important place to get in the entire routing process is getting to a point where you're shipping consistently. On that, one thing that you do, Alex, like I can think of your hot and cold audio, you went back, researched McLuhan. There's been many times where we've gone back, researched biology. You've gone back, researched Gerard, now Carlotta Perez, Carlotta Perez this week. What is your research process making sure that you both get deep enough to actually understand an idea, but also not stuck in an idea where then you're like, oh my goodness, I need to read more, read more, read more, because you're never going to be entirely satisfied with your knowledge. And how do you not get trapped in research? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so again, I would say like about... So this is going to be about 50, 50, like I would say about half of the time, like, for example, like this, like this week I'm writing about, um, or this past week, you know, I, I read about Carlotta Perez, right. And about technological re revolutions, of financial capital. I did not go back and read that book. I already know that book pretty cold, right. I've already read that book a bunch of times. Like I did not have to go back and be like, Oh, what did she say again? Like, I know that stuff pretty well. Other times like with McLuhan, I absolutely had to go back and read it because I could not remember anything that that book said. Right? It was like, I was like, oh, okay. I had to actually go find my copy of Understanding Media and like actually go back and read it and just be like, I am so out of my depth here. Let me just make sure that I have something that I can grab onto and understand. And in that particular situation, right, what I could grab onto and understand was, you know, I, I don't really know anything about media studies. I had read this book and I had sort of tried to understand it and tried to fill it in with what my experience was. But I do have a neuroscience graduate degree, right? I do have a fairly good understanding of what is the, like the neurological processing that's going on that is the underpinning behind this. So I had that as my anchor, right? To sort of pivot around. And so I used that in the process of writing um, the audio revolution, right? I used my understanding of, of neurobiology as this sort of starting point to then say, okay, right. I can now go explore in this nebulous world of communications theory that I don't know anything about to research, knowing that I have some sort of place of strength that I can fall back to. Right. So that's a great sort of general general pattern that I would say echo back to before is if you're going and doing some, as you call research about something, make sure it, that there is at least some strong connection to something that you know. Right. If there's no connection to anything that you know, then maybe wait until writing about it until you figure out something that there is and write about something else. Right. I don't know. It's like, but always write so that there is some sort of place that you can stand on confidently is really, I think a strong recommendation that I would urge. Tell me, so when you now are writing, like there's sort of two very different kinds of writing. I think what we've been talking a lot about is the kind of writing of going to look for new ideas of I'm going to write something new this week, but with, scarcity in the software century, the, the book that you're working on, it is different. It is one theme that you're writing about for 52 weeks in a row. How is that process of digesting the same general idea, but almost through a kaleidoscopic lens of seeing it from a slightly different twist every week? How is that different for you? Oh yeah, it's gonna be way more than fifty-two weeks. I'm not, I'm not half done. Are you kidding? Uh, so, so the scarcity in the software century is again. This is the the book that I'm writing. This has been this interesting experiment for me because I've never written a book before, right? I don't really know how to go about doing this, and it's been much harder, right? It's been way, way harder to actually produce something in this much broader theme and also shipping something week by week that is consistent. So something that I've learned to accept in this process is that I'm gonna throw out a lot of the writing that I'm producing and I'm gonna repurpose a lot of it in ways that I did not originally intend. The goal is to sort of figure out what this arc that you're building towards as you're doing it, right? So that's been really interesting. It's something that I've been learning along as I go through this. Um, one of the sort of decisions that I made a couple months ago as I'm doing this is that, so I don't want this to look like a totally traditional book in the sense that I want people to read it more like an encyclopedia than a book. Uh, so I'd like there to be like one sort of narrative that goes from front to back, but I want people to read it not necessarily in order. I want there to be lots of sort of pop out examples of text. So like examples from what I'm taught, like I basically want the book to read as though there's a consistent text that is basically a set of ideas and some theory and some big basic concepts. 
And then you're like, okay, show us some examples to have the example rather than being woven into the text in a way that's hard to find and hard to locate to just be in a little box that's popped out to itself. Right. Or to have like, Oh, what is some like further reading or what is some like a tangent that you want? Oh, have that be in a little box or whatever. So this has been fun for me to write because it's really transformed the writing process for me in that it, it has freed me from the burden of having to write something that is simultaneously in the right order and making the points that I want to make and richly filled with enough examples and the right examples that I want to have and something that I actually write in the order that it will ultimately go in the book, which is almost impossible, right? Over something that's of that length. So I realized that this was a constraint that I did not actually have to have. Right. And so I just decided I'm going to free myself of this constraint. And then that actually has made my life a lot easier. Right. So like, that's a sort of a general hint, which is that if you can identify some constraint that's giving you a hard time, and then you have the option of just getting rid of it, then do that. Right. That's like, if something is, if something is uh, causing friction for you and you have the option of getting rid of it, then just get rid of it. Right. <laughs> oh, you're unmuted. One, one final question before we, as we begin to wrap up, one of the things that I think that anyone who reads your work regularly will say is Alex's writing is always interesting. And you talked a little bit about navigating the space, the, the shape of the argument. I like that. And then also all your writing definitely has those two sides where when I read it, there's always, well, there's what these people think. And then there's what these people think. What else do you think contributes to interestingness in a piece of writing? What do you think those core tenets are? Hmm. Um, it's a good question. I, I, you know, I wish I knew the magic formula. Um, if there is, please tell me. Um, yeah, I would say that I would just reiterate again. Um, there's no formula for like really good writing, but the closest thing that I can come to it is again, like, create sides and force people to take one it doesn't have to be yours right it's like be it like okay here, here's here's a way to think about this um so i don't know how many of you uh watch pro wrestling at all but in pro wrestling you have the concept of the heel and the face right you have the bad guy and you have the good guy and there's a concept in wrestling and also in narrative generally which is called the heel makes the face right the villain makes the hero right this is a general principle of storytelling is that just a hero on their own is almost valueless as a source of narrative. There has to be a villain next to which the hero is defined, right? So you see people who are very, very effective at telling stories and very effective at persuasion, and very effective at getting you to think their way are often masters of this, right? They will help shape your argument in terms of what its opposite is. And when you're writing something and if you are trying to create sides and forcing people to take one, let your write, be comfortable with the fact that some people may read your writing and identify with it as the hero and other people may read that very exact same piece of writing and identify it as the villain, right? Be comfortable with that, right? If you're willing to let people strongly disagree with you, but then have other people strongly agree with you, then it means you're writing about something that matters, right? Which is honestly kind of the most important thing, right? If you're writing about something that matters and if you're writing at, in, about something in a way that forces people to confront something about it, then you're probably on the right track with something. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny because I'll read a lot of student writing and it'll say things like hard, like the central thesis will be hard work is good. And one of the things that you said earlier is what good writing has to have is an opposite. And it can't just be something that's like a cliche or tautology. Like everyone would agree that broadly hard work is good so that's not a good way to go whereas a couple weeks ago i saw something really interesting where michael nielsen went out and said actually maybe people are in flow states too much because if you're working in a flow state that might be something that you should be delegating and actually really smart people should be working in flow states less and i like that because broadly people just say hey spend more time in flow states. That's what everybody says. And Michael comes out and sort of says the opposite. And I think that that tension, that pull the, between the two sides is what creates the interestingness. And you always want to think when you write a sentence, is there a way that this isn't true? Because those are the good sentences.
lens is when you're trying to go out and prove something and there's that opposite side. Um, yeah, and in fact, I would even go a step further than that into the realm of the slightly risky and say the, 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 di the dynamic through which you should think about your writing isn't true versus false, it's hero versus villain. Mm. The truth is a complicated thing, right? Like there can be many different versions of the truth for different people with different points of view. And if you're talking about something that is really important, then maybe there isn't necessarily one obvious truth that it's consensus, right? Instead of thinking of like, how am I going to write about this, whether this is truth, but like the opposite of it might be false. Think, how am I writing about something in a way where I know who the villain is, I know who the hero is at the point that I'm trying to make. So to give you, let me give you a concrete example. Let me talk about this debt article that I wrote. So this article that I wrote last week um, that has half of people ecstatic and half of people furious, uh, which is a sign that you're on the right track, is an article that is talking about uh, the way that we fund startups in Silicon Valley versus the way that a lot of businesses are funded in the rest of the world, which is funding them with equity versus funding them with debt, respectively. And Silicon Valley is this place that has sort of created, we've gotten very, very good at growing startups in one very particular way, which is funding them um, all with equity, right? F funding them all through taking ownership stakes in these companies at these ever growing valuations. And it works very particular for growing a company that does one thing, which is either grow incredibly fast or die trying, right? It's really good at this one thing. And the sort of Silicon Valley elites, you know, like the venture capitalists and the founders who have gotten very good at this have constructed this world in which they've gotten very good at it. And they are the heroes of this world because they produce a certain kind of output. The debt piece basically took all of that and described it as it is and then cast them as villains rather than heroes, right? And this was very effective for a couple ways, right? There was a very clearly defined villain and, it, and conversely, a really well-defined hero who could be defined by, who could be understood with reference to that villain. It got a lot of people, it, like, it compelled people to read the thing because now the, this group of people that they know very well are being cast in a villainous light Right, which is like, oh my God, I have to read this, right? It creates urgency for why you should read this. Uh, and it created a starting point for a lot of uh, very, I don't know, emotional and urgent dialogue around the block, right? Because from the very beginning, there was a good understanding of who the villain of the piece was, right? You don't even need to know who the hero of the piece is. If you know who the villain of the piece is, then you're off to a good start. Mm -hmm. Very Girardian of you. We don't even know what we're going for. We're just, we know who the scapegoat is and we're going to, be against them. Well, a villain and a scapegoat aren't the same thing at all, I would say. If there, there, can, be, there can also be a scapegoat of something. Um, but if you understand, like, yeah, it's like if you, if you understand, like, I would say, like, if you understand what the, who is butting heads about this, and then you can understand, like, what the sort of weird side tangents that people will go on in order to try to find something to either bury the hatchet on or to try to find common ground or to find, try and find new frontiers to argue about or whatever, then that means you actually understand the landscape of what you're writing about pretty well. So yeah, I would think about, instead of trying to think about it like in like a Gerard context or whatever, imagine it's pro wrestling, right? Imagine if what you're writing is WWE, right? Imagine if what you're writing is something that Vince McMahon has to come out and, uh, Trump up on stage, right? And I bet you it'll be a shortcut towards writing really good stuff. Awesome. Well, um, I, I thank you so much for sharing with us. Really like seeing how you went through the sentences, this idea of casting the villain I've never thought of before. And is there anything else that you think before we head out that things that you need to tell people who write of if you knew this, you would be so much more productive and your writing would be better. Uh, I'll leave you with one uh, little writing hack that I use myself that is useful for me to get over sort of the, the anxiety barrier of publishing publicly. Um, so a, a lot of people, uh, me included sometimes, right? A lot of people, when they've written something, they're like, okay, I, maybe I think this is pretty good. They get a lot of anxiety around hitting post, right? Around hitting publish somewhere public. Right, because it's a big thing, right? It's a big thing to actually commit your writing to the harsh light of the outside world, right? It's something that makes people uncomfortable, it makes people anxious. So what I recommend doing is like find some tricks or hacks for how to make this easier for you. And I'll share you one that I do myself, which is 
when I write my writing, the process that I go is as follows is the first thing that I do is I will publish it online, but in a place that will not get a lot of reads directly, right? I'll place it on my own personal website, which is alexdanko.com, which is where I put all my writing. But if all you do is post it there and that's it, nobody's going to read it, right? If you don't distribute your writing, it's not going to get read by anybody right? You have like distribution is more is the most important thing. If you don't have distribution on, you might as well be like throwing it in a paper airplane out the street, right? It's not going to get read by anybody, but you can use this to your advantage, right? What I do is on Thursday or Friday night or something, I'll post it publicly on alexdanko.com, right? And then I'll just leave it there. Then I'll look at it in the morning. I'll sleep on it. I'll maybe do some editing. Maybe a handful of people will have read it and engaged it within or comment on it. And then I will actually just fully make edits, right? Depending, I will just shamelessly edit the thing that has already been published, but not yet distributed, right? And then once I've gotten over that a little bit, then I will, you know, I will tweet it out and then I'll, I'll get people thinking about it. And then most importantly, I'll send it in the newsletter um, on Sunday morning, right? One of the best things you can acquire is an email distribution list. Uh, it goes directly to people. Uh, it's a fantastic way to distribute things that's much, much stronger than social media. I know, David, you've talked about this a lot, so I don't need to cover this anymore. But like, get an email list, absolutely. But just to sort of to rephrase this trick, though, is break up the stages of posting things publicly in order to make any one step not that anxiety-inducing, right? It's a great little trick. And it'll probably help you get sort of familiar with this rhythm, right? It helps to have a little rhythm that you can do every week. So that's what I do. So I'll leave you with that trick. Uh, do anything that is necessary to get over the anxiety barrier and get over that initial friction of posting your thing publicly. You have to do it. So find whatever way works for you and then just do that. Uh, that's the message, right? That's the take home message. Fantastic. Well, for all of you, if you want to have conversations like this for five weeks and actually learn how to write clearly and consistently, build your email list, build your site, do all of this. I have seen hundreds of people who heard people like Alex said, I can't do this. And there's actually a lot of alums here right now who they've been surprised by their own results in Rite of Passage. I'm telling you, it is unlike any other community out there and you can absolutely do this. So don't let this be something that, oh, this is something for Alex, not for me. That's not the case at all. And thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Alex. And Thank you for having me. This is a great thing to do. So I'm thrilled to see so many people joining. It's just absolutely great. And let me leave you with one final thought, which is something yeah. that David has said a lot, and I think is just absolutely true. The returns to writing online in right now, February 2020, have never been higher and are only going to get even better. Right now is the time to do this. Right, like like I said at the beginning, every good thing that has ever happened to me in my career, I'm not joking, has come from writing online. You guys should do it too. Everybody should do this. Just right. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining.